All right, I think we're about ready to go ahead and get started. Before we do, um, I just want to let everyone know in our audience that you can submit questions today to our panelists. We're going to have a QA and a at the end of the session. Um, there should be a Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom video screen if you are on a computer or in one of the corners if you are on a mobile device. Um, and so with that, I will turn it over to you, Shay. Great, Mark. Thank you. And welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm so excited about the webinar today. Uh, I welcome you on behalf of the Stonely Foundation and the Center for Juvenile Justice Reform at Georgetown University. Uh, I'm Shay Bilchuk. I am Director Emeritus and founder of that center. Uh, and also proud to be a Stonely Fellow, uh, which has allowed me, given me the opportunity to uh, participate in a demonstration program um, in two counties in Pennsylvania. Uh, so today really is an opportunity uh, to familiarize stakeholders across the state of Pennsylvania uh, with the work that we are doing in both Erie and Pennsylvania counties. Uh, this work, as you'll hear during the course of the webinar, uh, builds upon the Pennsylvania Care Partnership uh, which is work around the system of care model and the crossover youth practice model, which was developed at the Center for Juvenile Justice Reform at Georgetown and now has been implemented in over 120 counties across the country. So what we'll do today is provide uh, some research on this population of young people, give you a better understanding of who they are, uh, what some of the characteristics are um, that they represent, and then also provide an opportunity to describe the actual demonstration program itself and what it hopes to accomplish. Uh, we are really fortunate today to have four panelists who will join us. Uh, John DiMatteo, who is Director of Human Services in Erie County. Uh, Lana Reese, who is Executive Director of the Office of Children and Youth in Erie County. Janet Dreitlin, who is the Mental Health and Developmental Disabilities Administrator at DHS in Delaware County in the Office of Mental Health and Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities. Long title, Janet, long title. Um, and then Melanie Govan, who is supervisor at the Juvenile Probation uh, Department in Delaware County, uh, heading up the intake services uh, branch. So um, we're gonna be getting to them in a little bit, uh, but I'm gonna start with a little bit of the research. And uh, as you see on the next slide, um, we'll be talking about uh, these young people we can move the uh, slide forward. There we go. So often when uh, people think of multi-systems youth, they think about youth that are deeply enmeshed in multiple systems of care. They're adjudicated dependent, they're adjudicated delinquent, or they're committed to placement in a residential treatment center, rather than thinking along the lines of a continuum of care. And this is what this slide allows us to do. In examining the four quadrants, we need to first take note of that prevention bar at the far left, always thinking about preventing system involvement whenever possible. And then the behavioral health and educational bar immediately below the four quadrants, reflecting the need to focus on the youth's education and behavioral health needs and issues that might be presented. The four quadrants themselves reflect the trajectory that a young person may take in their multi-systems experience. And I wanna kind of walk you through what that looks like. So the Two boxes on the top uh, show increasing child welfare involvement from perhaps voluntary involvement in the child welfare system, some preventive efforts moving over to a child welfare adjudication of dependency. And then if you go top to bottom, you see the increasing juvenile justice involvement uh, from juvenile justice diversion into potentially juvenile justice adjudication. So what, when we think about the continuum, this trajectory, I wanna focus people first on the top left quadrant a young person who is involved in child welfare with their family because of some uh, issue that has developed, but in a voluntary basis or a preventive basis and has touched the juvenile justice system, but is being diverted away from that system. So when I say that sometimes when we think about multi-system status youth, we think about deeply enmeshed youth, I wanna make sure people think about this on a continuum, that it could be going upstream, voluntary preventive services and child welfare, and then juvenile justice diversion. And then moving forward with the quadrants, we could see that we also have the possibility of child welfare, voluntary prevention, and a juvenile justice adjudication, a child welfare adjudication with juvenile justice diversion, or then perhaps those deeply enmeshed situations where we have adjudication in both realms. 
so when, when we think about working effectively across systems, we need to know where these children are in that continuum along that trajectory, along with their behavioral health and education issues and bring all four systems together in order to, um, to work more effectively. And this is the target population uh, for our efforts in the multi-systems integration program in both Erie and Delaware counties. So if we go to the next slide, we can see some of the characteristics um, and demographics of the multi-systems population. So first, the demographics. Um, what we see in this population of young people is there's an increased likelihood of them being female and an increased likelihood of them being black. Uh, so as much as we know from other projects that in which you may be involved, um, that we have disproportionate representation of black youth, for example, in the juvenile justice system or in the child welfare system, we see in the multi-system uh, population even higher levels of disproportionality. And that tracks with the girls as well. So if I, if I think about what would then be the cohort of young people that we would see most represented, it would be a black female population as in this multi-systems population. So as much as people are working on a disproportionate minority contact, <clears throat> disproportionate minority representation, or racial ethnic disparities, we need to know that in this population, we need to focus on this as a, uh, an element and make sure that we're, we're making efforts to reduce that disproportionality. We also see a higher proportion of LGBTQ, a gender non-conforming non youth, uh, as well as a, a higher probability in the population that if the, the crossover is occurring, this dual status or multi-system status, it often originates in child welfare and then moves into the juvenile justice system. So these are some of the characteristics that the research has showed us for this population. Also, we see that the older age at the first foster care placement creates an even higher risk for juvenile justice involvement at some later point in time. So often we think about the, the movement, the dual system status or multi-system status where it starts at a very young age. Actually, some of the research has showed us that adolescent uh, age onset is associated at even higher level with this juvenile justice involvement. So moving forward and looking at more of the characteristics, I've broken it out into to four domains on this next slide. First on the child welfare involvement, we see both histories of neglect and abuse. Um, we see higher rates of out of home and group placements in child welfare associated with the dual system or multi-system population. We see frequent placement changes and more likely to have a longer child welfare stay. So, so these are the things we're looking for and trying to impact if we're trying to reduce multi-system involvement. Um, we see school placement instability under the educational domain, uh, higher rates of truancy and suspension and expulsion. So once we, we get that instability factor coming into play, kids are moving from school to school, it's hard for them to keep up. They begin acting out that behavioral problem issue. They have lower academic achievement. They end up with the misbehavior often being um, suspended or expelled. So this is another key domain and why education is one of the four pillars of this project. On a psychosocial level, we see higher levels of substance use, more likely to have um, mental health challenges and increased likelihood of a familial mental health and substance use history, which may be related to the, the abuse and neglect. And on the juvenile justice side, what we see in this population is they tend to be detained at higher rates, but less likely to be diverted. So we need to understand why in a situation where a young person is presenting a, an offense similar to youth who had not been involved, let's say in the child welfare system, would they be less likely to be diverted uh, with a similar history? Uh, so we wanna examine that. Is that happening in Delaware and Erie County? And if so, what's behind it and how do we impact it? Let alone, how do we look at the detention rates for kids coming through child welfare into juvenile justice and whether they are indeed higher? The national research tells us they are. Um, they're more likely uh, to receive out-of-home placement if they come from the child welfare system. And they're about a year younger at the age of first arrest than other young people. Uh, so for those familiar with the body of work in juvenile justice around risk and need, in essence, what we are seeing here is an accumulating set of risk factors associated with delinquent behavior. Risk factors in some instances that might be introduced or exacerbated by the system's response 
to the underlying issues that we're trying to address. And often that underlying response is one that is fragmented, it's siloed, and it further exacerbates the child's situation. So again, some of the research, but also leading into why this type of multi-systems integration pilot program becomes so important. Moving on to the next slide, I wanna show a couple more related outcomes for multi-system youth. Uh, one, discrepancies between service referral and access. So it's one thing to think in our minds that whether it be diversion, voluntary services, adjudication in either system, when we refer to services, they're going to access the services, the youth and the family. And often through some of the studies that have been done, particularly this top one uh, from Culhane, we see that that often isn't the case, that they're accessing the services at significantly less lower rates than we would like them to. That study by Colhane was replicated also in New York. Uh, they're more likely to recidivate in both the juvenile and adult systems when we don't get it right, when we don't come together and do this work in an effective way. And then there are these low levels of school connectedness and difficulty accessing the appropriate services they need around their uh, educational support. And then uh, finally on the slide, the higher average cumulative cost across service areas. So this is a study done out of New York City that showed when we don't actually do this well at the onset, it actually comes back as a higher cost later on with ongoing system reliance for these young people as they leave their um, uh, age in the juvenile justice system and move on to adulthood. So in summary, this research paints a picture of the experience of youth that we find in the multi-systems population, impacted, I believe, both by their traumatic experience of abuse and neglect, as well as the secondary trauma they often experience as a result of their system involvement. So, so with that very brief introduction around uh, the research for this population of young people, I wanna turn actually now to our panelists and, uh, and pose the question. Uh, obviously you're involved in the project, which we are delighted by, it's been wonderful working with uh, you all and your, your colleagues in your county, but does this research and this background information that I just described, is it in sync with your own experience uh, in Erie or Delaware? And I'm just gonna ask someone to, to jump in with, uh, with a response, I'm not gonna call on people. So who wants to jump in first, Melanie? I'm happy to, yeah. So Melanie Govan from Juvenile uh, Probation in Delaware County. And yes, this is absolutely consistent with the things we're seeing. When uh, multi-system youth come into our system, we're often seeing the themes of lack of supervision, um, lack of financial resources, the emotional needs, the educational support not being there. So, so the um, education or the child welfare issues that are going on have often led the kids to uh, our system because of actions they're taking because of the lack of these other supports in place. Mm -hmm. So to me, when I hear your research, it's it, it makes sense. Thank you, Melanie. Others? Mm -hmm. uh, this is Janet Dreitlein. I'm also from Delaware County and I can, coming from the mental health side, um, I can agree with what Melanie is saying. We see these kids coming in with um, a lot of instability, a lot of, uh, different placements out of home <clears throat> and not a lot of supports. And when we try to wrap the supports around them, um, you know, we, we see that there are many other issues going on in the home, other, other types of, of um, problems that the children are having at school. Um, and uh, so I, I would agree. We, I would also agree that we are seeing similar um, to what you're saying, Shay. Yeah, great. Thank you, Janet. So in Erie County, I think we would agree as well. Um, we see many multi-system involved kids across time. Um, as we were sitting here, um, we actually have a tool that we can look at kids that are involved in multiple systems um, in our MHID, drug and alcohol and children and youth systems. And just looking at, you know, where that stands today, um, you know, 120 kids both have MHID uh, issues. 20 different kids have OCY and ID involvement. Uh, nine kids are MHID and OCY, and 107 kids are MHOCY kids. Um, we don't necessarily have that same other data to bump up against it quite yet. Uh, and 
I guess maybe I'm jumping in, I'm jumping ahead into why we'd like to uh, see some of the outcomes of this study. Great, thank you, John. Yeah, and I just would add, yes, we definitely see this too, and especially the um, the kids that come into the systems later, uh, we do see that they are involved in more deeper end services. Um, and you know, you can speculate that that might be because they were unable or did not have access to those certain prevention um, efforts or things that might happen there. So once they become involved, um, I think we all recognize too that the normal developmental uh, stages for an adolescent um, do include things like not conforming to um, authority, to experimenting with risks, um, and all of those things that we know are part of normal adolescent development are also a barrier to accessing services at the lowest levels of care. Um, they don't read well, you know, when it comes down to making sure that they're compliant with uh, rules, regulations. Um, it doesn't bode well, and unfortunately, that can lead to them um, inv being involved deeper and deeper into those higher levels of service. Um, and once you start down that path, the restrictions ramp up so those kids that already are testing the boundaries um, don't respond well to increase in boundaries and again that just kind of further exacerbates the issues you bring up the educational issue um, we don't have someone specifically representing education on the panel today but obviously education is involved in both of your counties in the project could you talk a little bit more about those educational challenges i think you know as people might look at that slide and say educational instability, behavioral issues, truancy, suspension. Um, what are some of the things that you think the, we struggle with around the intersect between education and child welfare, education and behavioral health, or education and juvenile justice? Um, you know, it, it comes from lots of different areas. Some of it's just the coordination. Uh, we all know that we all have a lot on our plates, no matter what system we might be involved in. And to be able to take that time to give the, um, the individual attention to the needs of that student when they might be moving into different educational um, overseeing entities. So you, if you're in a residential placement, um, you might be being educated by a different group than your home school of origin. If you move from home to home or area to area, um, the progress that you might see in education isn't going to be consistent throughout all of those different areas where that child might be residing. Um, there have been efforts to try and make that better through the Every Student Succeeds Act and trying to keep children in their home school of origin. And I think that that has been helpful. But even um, the funding and, you know, all of those kind of other barriers that are inherent to different systems are still present and the needs are there. Um, so when you interrupt that first educational experience and that continuum that they're on, uh, it just kind of, again, exacerbates um, their educational needs. And we do know that um, having a good education is foundational to having a successful life. So that's, again, why it's so important to have those partners at the table um, and why uh, having them be involved has been helpful. Yeah, it's so it, essential. It really it is. Was, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Okay, to, just to um, to add on to what Lana is saying, every time one of those, any time a child moves, moves in any way from a residential setting, from a home, from, from foster care, from a school, you know, when they're going from place to place to place, there's trauma involved there. And there's less and less and less of their ability to trust people and have those adults in their lives that are foundational and are able to assist and support them. And in addition, you know, we work really hard in Delaware County to put uh, mental health services into the schools and to push into the, the classrooms or push into the, you know, the, the educational setting. A lot of times those kids are so stigmatized, they won't seek those services out or they won't accept those services because there's peer pressure related to that. Um, you know, they're, they are isolated socially. They become more isolated socially if, they, if there's additional stigma attached to that. Um, you know, every time these kids move into another school district, it's a different social setting that they have to get used to, a different group of people that they have to um, learn how to interact with. And all of those things can be really traumatic to these kids. Yeah, I think about how education, um, although they might not love the academic part, but the social part of education, going to school, being with your friends, being involved in extra activities and, and having teachers who may be mentors and uh, you know, guiding you. When you lose all that, it's really hard. Uh, to your point, Jan, it's really hard so it's what you don't get, but it's also what you lose, right? 
So th there was a, a question and, and um, about the research, and I want to pop it up here, and I'll, I'll enlist your help in answering it too, although I'll go first. Um, so the question is, what are some of the causes as to why we see a higher number of young women or girls in the multi-systems population? Um, so I, I think we need to look at um, some of the psychosocial development of girls and how they develop. And I think, although I'm not an expert in child and youth development, um, I think what I've learned is that the developmental pathway and developmental needs of girls are somewhat different than boys. And as we see the experience of girls coming into, for example, the child welfare system, um, who may be removed from home, a lot of them thrive on their relationships and are more relational in how they function and stay healthy. Um, and so when we, when we deprive them of those relationships by removing them from home, oftentimes putting them into group placements rather than with relative caregivers, it really, I think, um, amplifies the trauma that they go through as part of one, the underlying abuse and neglect, but now compounded by losing a lot of those relationships and that relational contact that they thrive on, that they need in order to, to have some sense of normalcy in their life. So this is where the other experts on the, the panel can come in and jump in on this too. But I think when we look at the data, we begin to see that girls as, as a proportion of the population are experiencing those out of home placements into group setting at higher rates perhaps than boys are. They're experiencing some of the instability at different rates than boys. So that's what we need to unpack eventually in Erie and in Delaware County. Will the data show us that girls are overrepresented in the multi-systems population? Well, it shows that black youth are overrepresented and this small quadrant. Uh, but the research is pretty clear about this. It's been replicated in multiple counties that it shows up that this part of the demographic, being a girl and being a black youth creates that uh, disparity. So who wants to jump in on that? Clearly as an ex-prosecutor, uh, and juvenile justice official, not in uh, behavioral health or child welfare, that can't be the end all answer. I think it's an interesting question. You know, I think that, um, I, I think we're going to have to have some more of that research to see what are the underlying uh, causes. Um, sometimes I wonder if it's the length of stay in the systems too, that, uh, that at any moment in time, it looks like there are more because they might be staying within the, both of the systems a little bit longer. Um, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, there's lots of different components that go into um, the stays as well. You know, some of these, uh, they may be minors, but they also might be parents. So that might keep them in a system longer, especially for child welfare. If you're a parent of a child and you're also a minor yourself, that might keep you in a system longer. And it could be because you need more additional supports. Um, so, you know, I think that that's something that I think we're all um, interested in studying a little bit more and gathering some more data to see if it does ring as true um, in our, our, our counties as it does in other areas. Thank you, Lana. I guess one thing, Shay, just to add to that, is thinking about the disproportionate number of persons of color who are in poverty in our, uh, in our county. Um, it's a, a considerably higher number of uh, persons of color that are in, in that section, um, we also have a disproportionate number of persons who are medically assistance eligible in Erie County. I don't know if that is the same in Delaware, but we uh, have seen a poorer population, and I think that can be harder on female um, participants than male participants in their home lives. So um, that would just be my, my thought on that. I don't know if that's similar in Delaware or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting observation. I, I think this, this focus that we have on the girl issue does then transition us to a conversation about black youth. And, and the way we've, we've approached this in our work on the dual status or multi-system status is to say, if these are the characteristics and correlations associated with multi-system involvement, so out of home placement, group placement, movement and placement, school instability, lack of pro-social uh, connections, a lot of the things that, that tend to happen with these kids. Is it happening more frequently for girls than boys? Is it happening more frequently for black youth than youth who are not black? And if it is, why is that happening? And then how do we create a system case practice response that looks different? 
Uh, so I, I have to connect those two dots for both the question about girls and the question about black youth. So Shay, I think um, one of the things that we can't ignore in this conversation are those social determinants of health. Um, those issues that um, people that live in poorer areas, people who are, um, you know, and th there's a racial disparity, I, I know in Delaware County, between people who live in the poorer areas, people who are on um, social services, people who have issues with housing and food instability, um, you know, family support, social stability, all of those things that um, just are so important and are lacking a lot of times, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> in the lives of youth who are in, um, <clears throat> excuse me, poorer parts of the county. Yeah, and I think that if we go back to that quadrant slide in our minds at least, uh, not to actually put it back on the screen yet, but we would see that prevention bar and we would have to look at those social determinants and say, is that where we need to focus a lot of our efforts across Absolutely. the system? Now, I was in a meeting yesterday in another state and that came up as an issue. How do we look at our jurisdictional um, responsibility or even authority to act along the social determinants? For example, Melanie, if I am the juvenile justice agency, you know, I know who's at risk of entering my system. Do I have the legal authority, the statutory authority to actually get involved in helping to improve those social determinants? So I think it, it, that's probably that prevention bar on that quadrant slide. Okay, well, thank you for that uh, discussion. I'm gonna move back now uh, to describe the uh, pilot program itself. Um, and here, what you see on this slide is the goals of the pilot program. Um, so this next section of the webinar will explore how we respond to the research that's been described and what we know about the population of youth. There are two uh, significant national efforts that have focused on the multi-systems population of young people in this country. One is the Crossover Youth Practice Model, CYPM, and the other is System of Care, which I mentioned is the underlying body of work um, behind the Pennsylvania uh, Care Partnership work. Uh, the CYPM uh, focuses more narrowly on child welfare and juvenile justice dual system involvement, with System of Care focused on the core area of behavioral health with other systems intersecting into that behavioral health uh, core. What has not been done to date is to bring these two very successful system improvement efforts together into one pilot program. Our goal therefore is to utilize the CYPM and system of care to create a comprehensive new approach, one working across these four important domains, child welfare, education, behavioral health and juvenile justice to improve system level operation and then ultimately population level outcomes. In developing the pilot program, we looked into the successes of these two efforts and then built on the work of Dr. Denise Herz and Dr. Carly Durkheising, who came up with the dual system youth study design, a federally funded project, um, by modifying the rubric they created that identified the policy and practice domains that were most closely associated with the success of the CYPM, the Crossover Youth Practice Model, um, by adding two additional domains and refining the policies and practices, and we're gonna get into this, so as to strengthen the focus on education and behavioral health, we in essence created a new hypothesis that we could test in Erie and Delaware counties. Would this expanded rubric successfully guide the multi-systems integration needed to improve outcomes for youth involved in and presenting challenges in all four systems of care. So moving on to the next slide, I wanna introduce this rubric uh, that Dirk Heising and uh, hers came up with. Now we have added two domains. We've added the culturally competent and responsive services, and we added youth and family voice. While those were important areas of work uh, in the crossover youth practice model and in the original rubric, because of the emphasis and system of care, uh, such a heavy emphasis on these two dimensions, we actually added them as a 12th and 13th uh, domain, practice and policy domain uh, in the rubric. So uh, what we've got here basically is um, what we see in, in the needs uh, in terms of infrastructure to support cross-systems collaboration, those first seven on the left, 
and then the identifying and managing dual system cases, kind of the, the operational side of what we need to be doing in that regard. Uh, so, so going through them a little bit, just to explain them. Uh, on the interagency collaboration, we're looking at, is there a strong collaboration, uh, in a sense, almost at a leadership level, that the agencies, their leadership, their senior staff are committed to collaborating with one another uh, and working together for populations of young people that are intersecting more than one system. Uh, second, and so for every one of these domains, there are different levels of practice associated with them. And we're gonna be working with the two counties to identify where they are, we've already done that, and where they wanna go in improving uh, where they are in that level of practice. So the second one is judicial leadership. Our judges at the table, are they helping to lead these types of efforts? Um, this is always a tricky one because we have the canons of ethics uh, for judges. They need to be careful about how much they step into the fray in terms of advocating for certain things. Uh, but what we find is what's happened nationally is that judges can step forward. They can speak up about what they're seeing and they can help other people learn about what they're seeing in their court, in their judicial system. So others can take that information and, and do with it uh, what they need to, to, to improve those systems. So our judges at the table, are they helping to lead these efforts? Um, are we seeing the development of culturally competent and responsive services? We see the overrepresentation of young people and families of color. Are we being responsive to that and making sure our staff uh, can provide the kind of culturally competent case practice and responsive services that they're referring them to? And then are we really putting youth and families at the center of our practice? Are they, are they actually uh, given a voice about what's happening to them, to their families, in the way we conduct ourselves. So um, is this a priority of these agencies across systems? Uh, do they manage their work in a way that respects youth and family voice, not just at a case level, but at a systems level? Are our systems being designed and, and formulated in a way that listens to youth and families? And if the youth and family were asked the question, do you see in what we actually are doing here uh, a reflection of what you told us you needed? The answer would be yes. Um, are we setting up information sharing systems? What level of information sharing? Respecting the privacy interests of these young people and their families. Are we able to share information that allows us to effectively work across systems? Uh, are we collecting data that tells the story behind this population of young people? Uh, we, we can't blindly assume things because, because of anecdotal stories that we tell each other about the cases that we see. We need data to, to make sure we can examine, we can disaggregate factors and criteria uh, that would tell us more about the population and what they might be experiencing. So going back uh, to the question about why are girls surfacing at higher rates? Why are black youth surfacing at higher rates? We would be able to look at the data and disaggregate the data on gender, on race, on ethnicity and say, are kids of color, are girls experiencing out of home group placement? Are they moving in placement more frequently? Things of that nature. And then how are we training people across systems? Are we really investing in not just training in our silos as to what's expected, but bringing people together in a cross training manner? And moving to the right column, uh, this gets into that more operational side, identifying and managing uh, dual system or multi-system cases. Uh, can we identify the multi-systems youth? Uh, can we actually say when a, ch a child walks in the door at intake, Melanie, at, at juvenile probation, that you are able to say, yes, we know that this child is known to the child welfare system. And luckily in both of these counties, there's a good ability to do that. Um, assessment process. You know, are we aligning the assessment process in a way that doesn't burden families in going through, and young people, multiple assessments around risk or need, family safety, for example. Uh, what does case planning and management look like across systems? Are in multi-system cases, are the caseworkers coming together to do not just the assessment, but developing the case plan? And once a case plan is adopted, either in a diversionary way or through a court order, are we making sure that it's being managed together, that the case doesn't default to one system or one worker or another? Uh, are we focused on permanency and transition? Uh, to permanency. Uh, so this is a key one because I think generally, while in juvenile justice we have a, a heavy focus on reentry, I think this notion about permanency is a different way to look at these at these young people. And do they have the sustained supports that they need over time to be successful when systems are no longer 
uh, involved. And then placement planning uh, for these young people, as well as service provision and tracking. So all of this in the, in the multi-systems integration uh, pilot program is to be done on this far right column in a multi-systems manner where workers are working together as a team. If you said to a family or young person, uh, as this process was ongoing, can you tell me who's on your team? They would clearly be able to delineate who in education, who in behavioral health, who in juvenile justice, who in child welfare were members of their team, assuming the multi-system involvement is across all four systems. So I, I think the, um, uh, the, 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 the construct here builds on this wonderful work that hers and Durkheising did, expands it. So I'm not gonna say that, that what we get is gonna reflect exactly whether their design was successful or not, because I've added a couple of elements. I've refined every one of the domains to have a heavier focus on behavioral health and education more so than even what we saw in their design. So to, to give us a, a sense of why I believe this could be successful, uh, why Stonely invested in this body of work, Let's go to the next slide and see some of the outcomes uh, that we're experiencing in the crossover multi-systems work. So through the crossover youth practice model, these are the outcomes that we saw, the reductions in things that we didn't want to see and an increase in the things we do want to see. So I don't want to just read them off, but I think it's important to note that based upon the research that I presented about 15, 20 minutes ago, these ex are exactly what we'd want to see in changes at a population level lower recidivism rates, uh, lower use of pre-adjudication detention, improved educational outcomes, more access to pro-social activities, increased use of diversion, positive behavioral health outcomes, et cetera. And then at the bottom, you see one of the studies that was done at the University of Nebraska at Omaha showed significant jurisdictional cost savings through the implementation. This is just of the crossover youth practice model. So going to the next slide, we see some of the underlying a methodology behind these, how these studies were done. Uh, the end here is 19 different jurisdictions uh, that implemented the crossover youth practice model. The uh, idea of success was they had to see at least a 10% increase in a positive outcome between pre to post implementation of the model. And you can see some of the most common outcomes that these 19 sites saw. 53% of them saw fewer sustained petitions. 47% saw increased involvement in pro-social activities. You can read the rest, but I, I want to re-emphasize something to you. It is that, that this is not just a threshold. Yeah, we had a 1% increase uh, in the uh, fewer sustained petitions or involvement in pro-social. In order to be in this group of 53%, there had to be at least a 10% increase. There's a significant change pre-post that we set as the threshold uh, in order to identify them as the successful uh, post-implementation site. Now I want to move to system of care briefly. And there are three key areas on the next slide that we'll be able to see. One is focusing on the youth, another one, the families, and the other one, the service level. And, and I can just see Janet shaking her head up and down, even though she's not moving that head, because these are really wonderful outcomes we've seen from system of care. Uh, decreased behavioral and emotional problems, a reduction in suicide rates, a reduction in substance use, improvement in school attendance, decreases in arrests, increased ability of living situations. So key in light of that research that was shown earlier about that placement, removal of home and placement and stability coming into play. Why system of care bringing it together with crossover is such an important dimension of this pilot. On the family level, uh, decreased caregiver strain, uh, increased capacity to handle youth's challenging behavior. If, if you've listened in a, in a family focus group about what it's like to be involved in multiple systems, let alone behavioral health alone, it is chaotic, it is distressing. And when those systems don't come together, like system of care uh, operates, um, then they have the strain in, on their family. It exacerbates an already difficult set of circumstances. I know, Janet, you could probably talk forever about this. And then at a service level, uh, expanded accessibility to home and community-based services and more individualized services. Remember that access study that Colhane did. It was one thing to refer young people and families to services. It's another thing for them to access it. The way system of care works, it manages the cases in a way that supports the families and the young people in getting to the services that they need. So these are, are some of the really key um, areas and dimensions that are important for us to think about why we chose through this uh, fellowship to bring crossover 
youth practice model and system of care together. Because if we merge them, the expectation is the improvements will be even greater, including in the educational domain, as well as in the behavioral health, juvenile justice and child welfare domain. So going to the next slide. So, and to reiterate what I mentioned earlier, our goal here is to utilize the CYPM and system of care to create a comprehensive new approach, one working more effectively across these four systems to improve system level operation. So that's one thing we'll measure, system level operation, and secondly, population level outcomes. So that the, 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 the linkage here is one, systems actually will change the way they behave. They will actually do the casework differently across systems. And once we can show that, then we can show hopefully at a population level, the kind of outcomes that crossover and system of care were able to achieve. And then this slide uh, depicts the training and technical assistance through the Stonely Foundation that uh, we're able to provide. Uh, Meg Ogle and I are the two Georgetown staff that are working here. Meg is also a fellow at the Stonely Foundation but we're providing the kind of personalized jurisdiction specific assistance uh, in the areas identified by Erie and by um, uh, Delaware counties that uh, would need support and support time limited and ongoing work groups associated with them. So we're much to the chagrin perhaps of the implementation teams, we form work groups in every one of the important domains and that those work groups are currently at work developing how to fill the gaps that they've identified in their initial completion of the rubric. Uh, we do this with a lot of virtual Zoom calls. Uh, we've had one on-site meeting in both Erie and in uh, Delaware uh, counties. Uh, we're going to provide some uh, more of those on-site meetings, uh, ongoing virtual meetings, and then eventually, probably in 2023, we're hoping with the pandemic being a little bit less of an issue, doing a cross-site meeting that we'll, we'll probably do somewhere in the middle of the state. Um, and then networking opportunities. There are over 120 uh, crossover youth practice model sites around the country and countless system of care sites. It's been around since the mid 1980s, initially developed, implemented starting in 1990, mid 1990s. So lots of sites that we can network with. Uh, and then the work of Dr. Meg Ogle, uh, we are going to support the measuring of the impact of the implementation of the, uh, the pilot program. So very exciting uh, body of work, thanks to the uh, Stonely Foundation that we're able to move forward with this. So with that, I want to uh, pause again and turn back to our panel um, and talk about um, you getting involved in this work. And, and I think you foreshadowed some of it in the earlier questions that were asked. Uh, but what was your county's impetus? for joining the multi-systems integration pilot program. Uh, anything in particular that prompted your interest in participating? And again, I'll let people just jump in as they wanna come forward with their thoughts. So I can start off. <clears throat> um, Delaware County has a history of really working together across systems. And we were asked to complete the rubric that you had provided. I think it was provided initially by you. Uh, as Shay mentioned, we've been a system of care county for many years and have seen some great um, youth uh, outcomes as a result of that. So when we sat down across different, um, different departments to look at this, this uh, rubric and look at, you know, where, where were we really if we looked at each particular piece of what we were doing? And you know, are we really good at this? Are we just emerging at this practice? Um, it, it really started to get us to think about, you know, we're, pre we're, we're pretty good at what we do, but we could be better. And we could better serve the youth in our county and we could um, better uh, determine the flow of information and the processes that we're using um, and ultimately all work together in a much more coordinated way. Um, so that's really what has got us involved in uh, applying for this pilot and, and looking at, you know, exactly where are we now versus where could we be. Mm -hmm. That's great, Janet. Um, I know, Melanie, you weren't in the room at the point that was decided. I don't think you were, but maybe you were, but I'd love to hear your perspective from criminal justice uh, as well. Yes, it's funny you say that. I was, I was not initially involved in the um, decision to apply for this. So when I heard that we would be part of the project, I think that a couple of us were kind of like, 
but we're really good at collaboration. Why? Why? Who said we weren't good at it? Why are we doing it? What do you mean? So after we had a chance to sit down and um, like Janet said, really look at this stuff, I think that individuals are very good at it. And unfortunately, the systems as a whole might not be um, moving in the same direction at the same time, all the time. Individual people can really can really get stuff done. But overall, obviously the kids deserve consistent outcomes and consistent practices and all of us being on the same page. So the most important thing I think that um, we are hoping for here in Juvenile Justice Department in uh, Delaware County is understanding the roles and maybe more so the limitations of each of our agencies. What is children and youth service, services? Um, what's their role? What's their responsibility? And where can they stop? What's their limit? And then for them to understand the same from us. And then obviously the educational systems and behavioral health systems as well. But we've been trying for years to get CYS and JPO um, a good practice in place, a really good solid practice in place for working crossover cases. And we have trainings, we talk about it, we do a really good job for a little while and then it falls off. So that's really where we were coming from. We want to we want a solid practice that we've been trying to get to for about a decade. And I, I think that this can really help us get on track and add the quality assurance and the ongoing yeah. um, training. Yeah. Thank you. How about Neri? Um, you know, we, we were Systems of Care County as well and, you know, had some framework there to develop too. And um, I think that, that, again, we also do a really good job at collaborating. Most of the time that happens when you have an emergency, right? When you have like a specific case or a kiddo and it's it's like, okay, all hands on deck and everyone shows up and it's great. And, you know, you get a, a, the right resolution for this kid, but it's, it's kind of takes a little bit more time um, because we all have so many things on our plate to really um, dedicate the time and attention that it takes to focus it kind of upstream before we get to that point where it becomes that emergency. So I think that the reason that we wanted to get involved is just to help us to have that framework and for us not to always be the one kind of leading the discussion, to have that technical assistance that's really beneficial to have um, and not just be us like, hey, it's me again, you wanna to get together and talk about collaboration um, so that it can be somebody and that it can be research driven and really have that um, additional support um, and additional, you know, somebody else setting meetings and, and providing that expectation. Um, so it's another way that we can just continue to grow and expand our ability to collaborate and do what's best for the kiddos. Yeah. Yeah. I, if I, if I, before you speak, John, I just want to bring people back to that quadrant slide again, um, because that, that bottom right quadrant, adjudicated dependent, adjudicated delinquent, it isn't just how people generally tend to think about multi-systems youth when they're deepest in the system. It's that crisis point that you just described. And that's when we come together saying, oh my God, this child's busted out of three placements. There's no place for this child to sleep tonight. Who's going to take this child? And all of a sudden we're together. But what I think I've heard consistently from you has been, we want to go up into that top left quadrant also where it's a voluntary preventive service case, a diversion in juvenile justice, and figure out what we do there as well. And I think that that's the, the, the benefit of this to some degree. John? So my interest really is around what Lana has shared, but taking it one step further is really being able to share data. So I think we, we have been on the forefront in, in our county of really being able to collect a lot of data, but it's only our system that collects a lot of data uh, and shares it. I don't know that some of our other partners have been willing to share. Um, to me, I am not really great at being able to use anecdotal data to make decisions. Uh, as we look at programs and expansion and changes, um, it really is much easier to say, these are our numbers today and be able to stand on it versus I have this one scenario in which this one child ended up in this one place. Yeah. And so, uh, us being able to share that across multiple systems, when I'm saying multiple systems, I'm thinking about integrating the juvenile justice data, integrating that education data that is sometimes missing from our decision-making process. So that was my intrigue with, with this project. Um, I have been working in the system for a lot of years. Um, I think the collaboration is great. I think we have bridged a lot of those gaps. And people generally who get into this line of work do it because they want to help people and do the right thing. And I think 
everyone here on this has described that already, but we want to be able to do it in the most factual way. And I think this is a real opportunity for us to take those facts further. I, I want to make two quick comments, uh, John. One is that I love the way you mine data very quickly. So when we had our on-site visit, John was at his computer and boom, he's got data about population. You did it in the, in the webinar today. You pulled up some data immediately. And I think that's really a, a beneficial thing. But I also want to go back to your comment about the need to speak with about data rather than uh, by anecdote. Um, when I you know, moved from my local practitioner life, which I lived for 16 years in Florida, and came to Washington, D.C., to the Department of Justice, I would tell a lot of anecdotal stories. And you know, I was heading up an agency that had a big research division, and finally the research director said, just to be clear, data is not the plural of anecdote. You know, da data is a li little different creature here. And I think what I've been impressed with by, by both in Delaware and in Erie is the fact that you do want to mine this data, you do want to see it, not, not that you don't need to bring it to life through a story, but you need to make sure that you've got the real data, not be driven by an anecdote story that might be compelling. Um, <clears throat> one of those data points that we spent a lot of time in this country focusing on in the child welfare and juvenile justice system is around a racial and ethnic disparity. And, and I'm wondering whether if you think about well, this pilot program actually might provide a structure and mechanism uh, for each of your counties to examine uh, the racial and the ethnic and gender disparities and outcomes among this multi-systems population. Do you see that as an opportunity here? Uh, it, it, it's something I think that presents itself, but I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. I think it's a huge opportunity for us to go uh, in that direction and as we've been on this call, you were talking about um, those who uh, are African American and or female who are involved in our system. And I, I couldn't dig that deep that fast because I'm not that good, Shay. But <laughs> if I could make a call and phone a friend, I might be able to get the answer. But as I was looking, uh, our population, I, I said we have a, a desperate number of um, persons of color who are involved within our system. So our our Black or African American population here in Erie County is just under 8%. And the persons who are involved in our systems um, is almost 20%, it's 19.4% uh, of persons of color who are in our system. So, so that's how, how much it is. And I don't know if that translates to those persons in a residential treatment facility, mm -hmm. but I guess it's probably not far off. So um, we'll dig a little deeper on that, but. I really do believe this is an opportunity for us to take that information and use it instead of just having it. Yeah, I, I think the, the ability to disaggregate the data into race, ethnicity, gender is gonna allow us to see how these experiences may vary um, and may be contributing to the overrepresentation. Mm -hmm. um, any other panelists wanna talk about that one issue? That was John from Erie County's perspective, Janet. I imagine you look at this issue a lot in, in mm -hmm. Melanie on the juvenile justice side uh, in your counties. Um, um, we do. Um, the Department of Human Services has been undergoing and unpacking systemic racism project for the last two years. So this is something that's really in the forefront of our of our minds. Um, but, um, you know, we, we do see the racial disparities and we have an extremely diverse county. Uh, there are parts of our county that are extremely poor. There are parts of our county that are more middle class and, and wealthier. Um, in part, in one particular area of our county, there are over 70 languages spoken. Um, so it, it's an extremely diverse county with very, very different needs. Um, but um, we do we do see the disparities in the areas that are lower income, more poverty poverty stricken. Um, and, you know, for myself, I would also like to look at that in a, in a little more global, global way of overlaying some of those redlining issues, um, because I feel like that is sort of the underlying issues and where we sort of divided the county to begin with. Um, so yeah, it's something that definitely is in the forefront of what we're doing every day. Yeah. Great. Melanie, I, I know the federal government through the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention has a requirement that in juvenile justice, the counties need to look at, do you have these disparities? And if you do, 
Do you have a plan to try to address them? Do you see this project as being at least tangentially related to what you might be doing already? Absolutely. I know that, um, well, this is this, that this was a giant bonus and motivator to do this uh, project, to be able to look at these numbers more closely and see how it compares to the other studies that are happening in the county. Like Janet said, I am aware of the human services um, systemic racism efforts as of now. And I understand that Delaware County formed an equity child welfare task force as well. So this is going to be coming up a lot for us. Uh, and I, I'm glad we'll have uh, extra to contribute. Yeah, I, I'm really hoping that the project can build upon those local efforts. I mean, we're, we're going to crystallize and focus on the multi-systems population. Are there um, disparities in treatment that are going on that might be um, accelerating the involvement in these multiple systems of care? And is it being experienced in a disproportionate manner? Um, so that the disparities lead to the disproportionality, I should say. And I, I think it allows us to, to at least make sure in a narrow way we can focus on that, let alone the broader efforts that you have underway, whether it be in behavioral health, juvenile justice, or, or child welfare. So, you know, someone sitting in the audience for this webinar might be going, this sounds great, but this sounds really challenging. Um, do you have thoughts about uh, what the biggest challenges might be that you'll face or at least anticipate facing as you undertake the work uh, in your counties? So one of the things that has been a challenge for us in Erie County is for a county that is, I would consider a small to medium sized county, um, we have 13 school districts and getting the school districts to the table um, has been a challenge so far, although I think we've, we've jumped a couple of hurdles so far uh, in, in the last month or so to get people more to the table with that. Um, but I could see that being a barrier. And as you get to larger counties that may have even more districts than that, mm -hmm. that you know, just really deciding which ones to involve. Um, we, of course, went after the largest ones uh, first to get the biggest bang for uh, our data. So that to me is, is, is a big one. And the other hurdle that I guess I was thinking about when you said this, Shay, is really around um, employment and, and you know what people are calling the great resignation. Mm -hmm. So we're re-educating yeah. our systems constantly. I think we were always doing that on the behavioral health side because of the turn to turn over there and, and in children and youth as well. But it, right now it's really across all of our systems. So people that you may have already had those relationships with uh, in those cross systems that I know Melanie talked about, Janet and, and Lana talked about as well, those relationships that we've had, some of those people have moved on and changed. And so now we have to reestablish those relationships and educate those folks along the way. So I think, I think that is probably the, the number one and maybe the schools is number two, if I had to rank them. I think the schools are frequently a challenge in the, the multi-system work that we've done at the center, um, mostly because there, are, there can be so many different school districts. I mean, one of the sites we worked in initially was Miami-Dade County, one school district. That was like a blessing. But then you go to someplace else and you might have 42 school districts in a big county. Um, so I, I think having to uh, make sure you have representative uh, school districts at the table, that you're piloting with those school districts uh, coming to play with the new protocols and procedures that you're adopting, and then to be able to show and expand that to other school districts as well uh, is the way to do that. The, the point you made about the workforce, uh, John, um, was also raised by one of the participants about um, addressing the decreasing number of social workers, ability to work with youth and families. Um, and oftentimes we're, we're the, the word used in the question was diverting kids to the juvenile justice system by not having sufficient staff in child welfare uh, when the child really perhaps belongs uh, in the child welfare system alone. And, and I, I think my answer to that question would be one of the goals of this, this pilot program is to make sure that's not happening, even with the shortage of staff that we're coming together in a way around case assessment, planning and management, that that doesn't end up what's happening, that we decrease those kids who don't really need to be or belong. I, I thoughts about that. So other challenges that people see that, that you might have to take on in order to move forward with this successfully. 
I know we're seeing uh, in Delaware County, I anticipate others across the state are seeing the same, but the wait lists for mental health services. Um, obviously, staff shortage in those areas and the kids aren't able to receive the treatment timely, um, their behavior, their mental health deteriorates, their decision making goes along with it and they end up um, with us here in juvenile court, maybe, you know, again or for longer. So. We also have, I believe, staff shortages in the schools. I know that I had two young people were working with the past several months who were deemed eligible for one-on-one -on -one support at school, but the school district couldn't hire anyone to do it. So, you know, the kids were getting in trouble all day long at school. So those, uh, those are definitely going to be barriers for us moving forward. Mm -hmm. Anna? I also think that <clears throat> Melanie hit something on the head when she initially started off talking about how we all need to understand what each other does and what the abilities and the limitations of each department are. Um, I think that, you know, we're, we're when, as, as Lana said, when, when the kid is in significant need and we're all coming together and we're all sort of brainstorming around that child, you know, it, it sort of all comes together, but just on a day-to-day -day regular in and out basis for, for us all to have a really good working knowledge of what each system can do, what they can't do, what their limitations are, what their abilities are, what their requirements are to be able to provide the services that are needed. Um, you know, I think that level of education and that level of uh, information is something that um, we're lacking on a very basic level in, in um, Delaware County. And, and I think that's something that we need to kind of break down. I absolutely agree with that, Janet. And to add, to add a little of a twist here, and some other counties in Pennsylvania are likely experiencing this as well, we have lost um, our detention center closed down. So the juvenile probation department doesn't have access to secure detention beds. So there's been situations where we're calling children and youth services saying, um, this child has nowhere to go. Uh, please help figure it out, find somewhere for them to go. And it's damaging the relationship because CYS workers are kind of looking at us like this isn't our, this isn't something we would normally deal with. Damaging the relationship and it's confusing the staff because sometimes this is your role, sometimes this isn't your role. Um, so that crisis is, 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 uh, has been difficult. Well, and then after they call Melanie, they call me because they assume that mental health services are, are able to provide, um, you know, a, a bed or a, a location for this child to, to stay. But there isn't a real good understanding of medical necessity and needing to have it prescribed by a physician and understanding what the recommendations really are for that child. So it, in, as, as Melanie said, you know, as we kind of roll through these different departments, it, it can be a struggle with the relationships and making sure that we're not damaging those relationships. Yeah, I think that we're all kind of describing a compression of the system too, especially at those higher levels where we really need to just make sure children are safe and have a place to go that night. Um, we are fortunate enough that we do have a 20 bed juvenile detention center. It's not available for other counties, um, but you know, and I know we, we had been. And I think that that's the reality is that prior to December of this past year, we had really thought of it as a regional asset um, and had offered it to other counties, but because we, we are full or at a higher capacity level than we have been in over a decade with our own youth, we have not been able to lend some of those beds. Um, at the same time, two regulations come into play, which also compress the system um, where the kids that used to be Fisher build uh, have to go to the juvenile justice systems prior to being having an interest of justice hearing. And then they'll end up potentially in the adult incarceration system. But, you know, I think that that's the reality, too, is that sometimes um, each one of the systems will enact their own uh, new regulations or, or new things that we have to follow without really understanding the overall intended um, reverse domino effect that it's happening on in our entire system. Um, and again, a lot of good people out there doing really good things and want to be helpful. We get into this field because we want to be helpful. And when we can't, it feels really bad. And you know, I think that, and just that um, the overall mood of the whole system is, is overwhelmed and um, irritated in some respects too, which is not a healthy way to operate from too. So just to kind of acknowledge that some of our systems are struggling with that 
um, when helpers can't help, it hurts them too. And I think that um, that's something that we're facing too. And I think also contributes to our, some of our staff shortages because we are expecting people to not just handle their own work, but to handle other people's work who are not available or no longer in the field. Um, especially at a time when, you know, we've talked about, um, it used to be that, you know, you had your prevention and then you had your intervention and then, you know, your top level of the pyramid who, who really needed more assistance. And it seems like now all of the people need an intervention, not just a prevention, because um, we're all struggling with uh, figuring out what normal looks like, figuring out what an unpredictable future might look like in a post-pandemic world. Um, and without the normal channels or operational things that we used to have access to and that we used to rely upon as supports, whether that be individuals or systems that don't function as they previously did. Now, I don't think the pilot program is the end all solution to everything that you all just described. But I think that one of the benefits of the pilot program is that it will bring all four systems together. And we'll do a lot of training across systems about so why do you do that the way you do it? You know, what is your capacity? What, you know, are your constraints? What is your ability? And, and once you get, I call it myth busting um, and, and moving away from the blame game into, you know, we're all in the same boat together. Uh, the classic cartoon in this was, there are two people in the back of a boat and two people in the front of a rowboat. The two people in the front of the rowboat are bailing water, but there's a hole in the two people in the back saying, I'm sure glad we don't have that problem. But we're, we're really all in this together. And so how we in Erie and in Delaware, see, I've already become the we, uh, how we figure out what are the policies and protocols that you want to follow? How do you do the training so there's an expectation and understanding? How do you set up performance measures? And as Melanie described earlier, how do you set up the quality assurance to make sure you actually are continuing to do what you said you were going to do? I, I think um, gives us a chance uh, for success in this effort. So it isn't, as was described earlier, we did it for a while and then we stopped doing it. You know, it's an ability to keep tracking and monitoring what we agree to do. Um, which I guess brings me to, you know, I don't want to, to go down a deficit thing. What are you going to be the challenges? Um, but so what do you have the hopes? What are the hopes for this? You've touched on a couple of them already, but what are your, your goals for the work overall? How would you, you convey that to the audience? So I would say in Delaware County, my, my goal, what I'd like to see is see us to um, get a, get to these kids sooner, wrap the services around them better, and keep them out of the juvenile justice system um, to uh, address some of those social determinants of health for the family and utilize you know what supports we do have um, to identify some of the mental health issues that may be in play with some of these very young children. Uh, I think it's, it's um, it's only a, a fairly new practice of really looking at small children and the mental health issues that might be at play and uh, making sure that um, there are services to support them. And, I, and you know, again, part of the challenge of that is that we are in a great resignation and it's hard to find those services. But you know, by combining the system of care with this pilot, you know, we're bringing together um, lots of people and lots of resources that we can <clears throat> bring to bear to this situation. Right. Yeah, it, it really feels like a mobilization around uh, some of the issues. Others? We have seen more people joining in the conversation and wanting to kind of create their own grassroots supports. Um, the need has been identified, the people that are in need in their own system. So for instance, the schools are trying to increase their level of support that they and, and acknowledge the behavioral health needs and the trauma that um, the kids are going through. They're really kind of um, bringing all of that to the forefront and to the discussion. Um, some of our uh, health system partners are also um, joining with us, our United Ways, um, some of our philanthropic groups as well. Um, so I think it's just important for us to help welcome them to the table and to help create um, and whatever ideas that people want to bring, just kind of being open to those as well and, and seeing if there are other partners out there that can help. Um, even bringing the youth to the table, and I know we've mentioned that before, but there are a lot of youth who have really great ideas um, and just maybe need some help with implementation and how we can help um, bring more voices to the forefront so that we can uh, just not retry some of the ideas that we might be used to as systems, but 
think about this as um, a more societal uh, uh, concern and issue and just kind of help um, in those prevention efforts, especially. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really important. Uh, anything else in terms so, of goals? I'm, I'm generally uh, an eternal optimist as it comes to our system here in Erie County and always looking at how do we take whatever difficult situation we're in and make it an opportunity to reshape things. And so they've continued to talk about how do we use those lack of services in a particular area to maybe refocus our mental health system, especially to the services that are needed most. Um, I think at times um, systems will, will, the capacity will drive what people get. And so we don't want that. We want it to be the most needed services. So we spent a lot of time over the last couple of months um, since we've actually embarked on this process, talking more about how do we reshape those systems? So, you know, Janet and, and Melanie and Lana have all described, you know, the lack or the weight for services at times. So, so locally, I know we are struggling um, with partial, partial hospitalization for really young kids. Um, if, if Lana's asked me, once in the past uh, month, she's asked many more times than that uh, about how we can nudge our providers to that population because it's really something we are seeing on the child welfare side. Uh, intensive behavioral health services and family-based also, again, services in which, uh, if anybody else is on the call from Pennsylvania, I'm sure you're all struggling with those same levels of care. Um, I think we were prescribed in family-based at one particular point in time. And I think it's the right sizing of those things. So I'm optimistic we'll be able to use the data that we are getting through this MSI project to really talk with our system about what the highest needs and highest priorities might be for our levels of care. Okay, thanks, John. Melanie, anything to add to that? No, overall looking to improve the outcomes for the children and the family. Uh, one thing that I've, I'm really looking forward to is um, having the parent feel as though they're part of the, the team, that there's not four different people pushing them that, you know, to and from each other, um, that we're kind of a, we're, we're a team. And I want the family and the parent to feel as though they're part of the team. So looking forward uh, to collaborating with the other systems to make that vibe. Okay. So I, I want to remind the audience that we've got about 15 minutes left. And so we want to make sure if they're questions, you put them in the chat. I do have a question about law enforcement agencies and how can they help with this work? What would be their role? What could they be doing? Uh, I'm gonna turn to the panelists first. I have some thoughts on this, but um, when you think about the law enforcement intersect with this multi-system type work, what do you see as the main two or three things you would say, this is why it's important you're at our table? Um, our law enforcement, we're fortunate in uh, they have really identified the needs. Some funding cuts have um, made their uh, available staff smaller. So we lost things like our crisis car, who would respond to things like domestic violence or other areas of um, kind of social concerns. And we've really been um, talking more and more with them and coming to the table more with them to have those discussions about how we can help partner together or how we can co-respond or notify each other when the intervention that's needed might not be law enforcement, but it might be more along the lines of social services. Um, so there's really a, a better familiarity and understanding between those two systems about the what we can and can't do and how to access those um, systems. So again, it kind of um, one of the areas that it's one of those uh, things that were a negative it, that we're seeing so much more of it, but it kind of brought that conversation back to the forefront and back to the attention of the law enforcement and the, um, the social services communities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I, let me ask others. I, I want to jump in with my own answers, but I want others to jump in with what your thoughts are. Melanie, do you have a thought here about law enforcement role? I think I like having law enforcement at the roles or at the table so that they understand the um, possibilities for diversion. I don't know if they all recognize the idea, the possible, the different possibilities. It doesn't, there are different levels of diversion. So I would like them to be included in that. Yeah. When we think about diversion, we need to think about there's diversion by law enforcement, but simply making a choice on a non-serious case, not to arrest, but to refer to services. There may diversion a diversion recommendation to the intake office at a probation department. Lots of different ways diversion can 
and operate, including in, in Pennsylvania. Um, so that's a really, really good point. Uh, because I hear from a lot of police officers that <clears throat> they need to understand better what diversion could accomplish with some of the kids that they're they're working with. Janet or John? Um, <clears throat> we do a lot of uh, crisis intervention training with the police officers and first responders in our county. Um, and what that allows us to do is provide them with the resources that they can divert. Um, that they can provide, um, that there are, you know, services out there for these kids. We also have a mobile crisis team that can uh, be called out if there's a need for an assessment right at that moment. Um, so really partnering with the police is very important so that they understand <clears throat> that we can address these needs quickly if we have to. I mean, if a child is in crisis, we, we can address those needs. Um, so, um, you know, and that it doesn't necessarily have to be an arrest. It can be a, a service um, diversion. Um, and, you know, we, we're we unique in Delaware County in that we don't have an overall county police force. We have many small town police forces across the entire county. So we're trying really hard to kind of get into all of them and get some people trained and, and you know, understand um, that, you know, what, what's available, what, you know, what could we do in the county to support them as well. So it's important for them to be at the table to assist these kids, but it's also important for them to be at the table so that we can train them and, and give them the information that they need with regards to the services. Thank you, Janet. Melanie, anything to add? Okay, so I wanted, I want, I'm gonna jump in with a couple of thoughts because this issue on law enforcement role has come up in virtually every one of the 120 crossover counties that we've worked with. And, and so I'm, I'm really delighted that the question was asked. Um, I, I think what, from my perspective, what I hear from law enforcement is we're viewed as the hammer. We're viewed as the solution when the provider wants a child arrested and removed from placement. When the family says, I'm tired of this child and they just hit me and I wanna press charges on a domestic violence battery. Uh, when they get called by a school principal or guidance counselor saying, we have had it with this kid and they just damaged property in their classroom, we want them arrested and removed. I want to hear from those police is, in that situation, I'm being asked to perform a function rather than to be part of a solution. And what I would like to know is what are the tools that we would have together to deescalate behavior? So very much the points that you've just mentioned about crisis intervention, you know, how do we make sure that all our school resource officers are trained in crisis intervention? So that CIT type training has taken place, that when there is a placement that has a lot of kids churning through it, that the law enforcement call is met by an officer who has had CIT training, that mobile crisis response from behavioral health responds in tandem with them. And their number one job there might be a criminal referral, uh, but the number one job is to de-escalate and maintain placement if at all possible, rather than begin the process that we saw in the research, which is multiple group placements, moving from place to place, school instability. We're kind of feeding into some of the risk factors that might impact those children and, and accelerate their movement into the justice system more deeply. So- It's traumatizing, it's traumatizing. Yeah. It's traumatizing not just to the children, it's traumatizing to the family, it's traumatizing to the police officer. It, it's, you know, it, it, there's a lot of trauma that goes along with that whole process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a question on the board um, about young people being at the center of decision making about their lives, that the family must be present, but citing to you, Melanie, uh, how are your systems allowing you to define things like safety and family? Are they being asked to define those things? And I think that kind of youth-centered, strength-based uh, practice is something that we'll be doing. I think you already do it in both of your counties, but making sure that it's present in these types of cases, um, that kind of cross-system collaboration, Amy points out, uh, there doesn't seem to be a consistent approach to actually centering youth voice, not just checking the box that they ask them if it makes sense. So I, I think this is actually a core principle of system of care. It's a core dimension of what we want case practice to look like uh, across the board in these multi-system cases. Melanie, I see you shaking your head. Do you want to comment on that? 
Yes, I, I actually, um, I was reading that question and as well. And that that's one of the expectations I think that I, I have for um, participating in this is at the end, we will have a consistent approach to bringing the child's voice to, uh, to the decision making process. And I admit, I'm not sure we're doing the best we can right now. So yeah, I, I think the the, the true test is, is the actual family team meetings, child and family team meetings that actually happen the way they should, that reflect what Amy was talking about in her question. And I think that's something we're not going to bring that to the project except to say, we want to make sure that you're doing the quality assurance around that casework uh, so it's being done in that fashion. Um, and, you know, we, I, for those of you who are at the, um, the round table meeting down at Seven Springs, I know that there was some discussion about how you counteract the trauma. Um, and kind of create that resiliency. And one of the take home messages that we heard and that we're trying to take action steps on is really understanding how important that one caring adult is in someone's life and how um, having a, a, a mentoring program is, is very important. Now we know that mentoring programs filled with the same old mentors don't work well. So I think that to Amy's point to um, having the child be able to identify who is their family, who is the person that in their life that makes them feel safe, and then inviting that person to the table, I think is, a, is going to be something that we really are going to try and, and take forward um, as some of our action steps too, because we really, um, we know that it can't just be us. We just can't be the same people coming to the table. The mentors can't be the same people coming to the table. We really do need those youth and family to identify the people that are, um, important that our family that are their safe havens in their own lives and yeah. build upon that yeah that really is the key because for so long these young people and families have not built trust with these systems but distrust because they weren't put at the center of decision making their voice wasn't heard uh, clearly and they turn away from the systems uh, it makes it one of the challenges when you take on a new multi-systems integration effort and you're sitting down with families saying we're coming together to help you and I think the response in many instances will be, show me, show me, prove to me that I can trust that this time it might be different. Um, there's a couple other questions. We've got about two minutes left. Leanda, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. I think we, we addressed your question to some degree about the increasing number of social workers and the need to really do the work differently. I don't know we're going to solve that, that workforce issue in the next 12 to 24 months. Hopefully it will get better. Um, <clears throat> but that working together hopefully creates um, case assessment and planning that would would create kind of a buffer to say, no, we're not going to let this kid just migrate into the juvenile justice system, or we're not going to take a child and refer them back to DHS because we can't handle them because of low case loads. That the case assessment and planning has to look much different, that the case plan really is in the best interest of the child. And then I think the Flora's question about or comment about a lot of the family disruption and child placement could be undercut if we intervened at a much earlier age. I think those social determinants and early intervention efforts at the front of that, that quadrant slide, I think speak to that. But do either of you, any of you wanna comment quickly about the need for the early childhood uh, piece of this puzzle? Um, we kind of did a retrospective study with our earlier intervention um, kiddos that were involved in behavior supports, and we did see that there seemed to be a strong correlation between that and deeper end services later in life. So we definitely see that as an opportunity to engage with um, early intervention, in particular the uh, youth that are involved in behavior supports, um, and to see if we can make sure that we're, they're not getting kind of lost in the cracks between um, our part of the early intervention birth to three, and then when it hands off to uh, the Department of Education from three to five, and then of course, um, continuing on after that. We are seeing in Delaware County, children being <clears throat> kicked out of preschool because of behaviors. Kids at that level that have behavioral needs have, have uh, you know, uh, mental health needs and, um, we're just now really trying to delve into that a little bit more. But, you know, you imagine a two-year-old that's unmanageable in preschool. That's, you know, that's a, that's a hard thing to, to, uh, to imagine. Most people don't think of, you know, young kids getting kicked out of preschool like that. So I know we are one minute past uh, going into the final section, um, section of our, our webinar. Um, so this is really the ultimate lightning round question. 
uh, very quickly for Erie County, do you use youth court? I know we don't have Mary Jo Battle on the line, but John, Lana, do you, do you know if you use youth court? Um, I, I don't believe we use that particular model. We use family treatment courts and um, family dependency court, but we don't, uh, I don't believe that we use the model that's being described youth court. Great, okay. Okay, so that, that might be something, Greg, that you wanna surface somehow post webinar um, that, that uh, was the reason you asked the question. And then I think the last one, very quick comment here uh, about what type of training will families and youth receive in order to better advocate for themselves in the multi-system approach. You know, we're dedicated to bringing families to the table as part of the implementation team. So hopefully we're helping to facilitate that. But I think what you're noting here in your question is a really much bigger question about how do we support a developing independent family youth organizations that can advocate for their position when it's not just being part of a panel, not being asked to testify at a hearing, but really empowering organizations that represent youth and family voice. And I think both counties have those types of entities that exist, uh, but how we further empower them will be one of the points of discussion as the work unfolds. Before we move on, um, and I have the privilege of turning it back over to Anne Marie McGrory, um, <clears throat> to actually turning it to her, uh, to make some final comments on behalf of Stoney Foundation. I wanna thank two people in particular, not just our panelists who were terrific today, uh, but there's always people behind the scene. So I wanna thank as a group, the implementation team, both in Erie County and Delaware County, a group of 30, 35 plus people that have come together, work groups formed to do this work, but also specifically in Delaware County, Laura Keebler, uh, and in uh, uh, Erie County, Melissa Bible, who have been, um, designated. I don't know if it was a voluntold piece or not, but both of them have stepped forward in, in taking on the job of liaison with Georgetown and Stonely in making this happen uh, in a meaningful way in both of their counties. So I know they're not front and center in one of these boxes on your Zoom screen, uh, but both of them have been spectacular in helping to advance the work. So thanks to them. And with that, Anne-Marie, over to you. Thank you so much, Shay. Good afternoon, everyone. As Shay said, I'm Anne Marie McGrory. I'm the Director of Communications at the Stoneley Foundation. I'd just like to say, on behalf of Stoneley's Executive Director, Ronnie Bloom, our entire staff, our Board of Directors, and of course, the Center for Juvenile Justice Reform, um, I'd really like to thank our excellent lineup of panelists, John, Janet, Melanie, and Lana, for sharing your perspectives and really your expertise with our audience today. Um, as we examine and enact new ways to better meet the needs of young people who are involved in these multiple systems across Pennsylvania, you've given us, I think, an exciting new roadmap for the work ahead. And of course, I'd like to thank Shay Bilchek for your insight-rich presentations, uh, your really stellar moder moderation of today's discussion, and more broadly, your leadership in the field. Um, we are really proud and honored to count you among our Stonely Fellows. Um, now that the multi-systems integration pilot program is underway in Erie and Delaware counties, we're excited to track progress of this groundbreaking initiative across the state and hopefully nationally. Uh, we'll continue to provide you all uh, with updates on this important work in the coming years. So stay tuned for future um, events and updates about this work. With that, I'd like to thank everyone in our audience for tuning in today. We're really appreciative of your time and your questions and your attention, and we hope to see you at our next event. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Emory.